Turn with me now to the book of Romans, chapter 10. We will read verses 14 through 21, continuing at our breakneck and speedy pace through the 10th chapter of Romans. I would like to have finished it last week, but you are all not willing. Hear thou the word of God Almighty. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Let us pray. Almighty God, your word is truth. And you are a refuge to all who seek you. We ask that you would bless your word, that by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, you would open our ears to hear, that you would soften our hearts, that you would bless the preaching of your word and bless us in the hearing of it. We ask for your help, O God, in Christ's name. Amen. Our focus this evening will be on verses 16 through 21. Previously, in verses 14 and 15, we saw the necessity of the gospel ministry. We noted that whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved, but in order to call upon the Lord, men must first believe, and in in order to believe, men must first hear, and in order to hear, there must be preachers, and in order for there to be preachers, those preachers must be sent by God. Well, God has sent preachers. They have preached, their message has been heard, and some have believed and called upon the Lord and been saved, and yet some others have not believed, and they have not called upon the Lord. Consequently, they remain under the wrath and curse of God. What then is the difference between those who hear the word and are saved and those who hear the word but are not saved? The difference, as we will discover, is that the former obeyed the word, whereas the latter disobeyed it. You, beloved, must obey the word of God. Obeying the word of God implies hearing and knowing it. But you can know and you can hear the word and yet not obey it. This is demonstrated quite powerfully with the sad case of the nation of Israel. They had abundant access to the word. They heard it. They knew it. They heard it read every week in their synagogues. They spoke of it. In fact, they interacted with the word of God incarnate in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, they did not obey the word of God. God's outward means of salvation, the preaching of the word of God, became to them a means of of their condemnation. So then you must obey the word of God. We're going to look at the rest of this text in two points. Number one, you must obey the word of God. And that will be in verse 16 and 17. And number two, you can hear and know the word of God and yet fail to obey it. And that will be in verses 18 through 21. First of all, you must obey the word of God. The first half of verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. We're not accustomed to thinking of obeying the gospel. 
We tend to think of the gospel as something that we believe. Not something that we would obey. That is half correct. The gospel is something we must believe. But it is also something we must obey. There are three reasons that we must obey the gospel. And first of all, the gospel is an announcement of good news. Right? It is an announcement about what God has done in his son for your salvation. But that announcement requires a response from its hearers. You see, the gospel is both an offer and a command. In the gospel, we are offered forgiveness of sins and life in Jesus Christ. That is to say, on the condition of faith in Jesus Christ. That's the offer. But here's the command. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, we read... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The word believe there is a command. It's an imperative. And remember, this is the Philippian jailer saying, What must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul commanded him, Believe and you will be saved. Similarly, the Apostle Paul again in Acts 17.30 said, God commands all men everywhere to repent. You see, that's a gospel command. To re- the command to repent is a part of the gospel. What I want you to know is that you will not receive the promised forgiveness and life if you do not obey God's commands to believe and to repent. Meanwhile, when you believe and when you repent, you are obeying the commands of the gospel. So that's the first reason. Here's a second. A second reason why you must obey the gospel. The confession you make and the calling by which you bind yourself to obedience and the one who saves you, the one to whom you are calling, they are one and the same. Let me try to say that another way. The confession you make is that Christ is Lord. And the one whom you call upon is even Jesus Christ, the Lord. When you confess the name of the Lord, whom are you confessing? When you call upon the Lord, to whom are you calling? Pay special attention to those four letters in the English, Lord. A Lord is one whom by definition must be obeyed. Whoever confesses that Jesus is Lord will be saved. Whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved. But we can't be like Peter when Jesus offered to wash his feet and he said, No, Lord. Never in the history of utterances has there been a more contradictory utterance. You cannot at once confess Christ to be Lord and at the same time tell him no. Jesus said it this way, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do the things which I say. You see, it is inherently contradictory to confess that Jesus is Lord and to call upon him as Lord and at the same time not obey him. Therefore, since the gospel itself declares that Christ is Lord, the gospel carries with it an inherent, an inherent command to submit to Christ as your Lord. Here is a third reason you must obey the gospel, and that is because believing and obeying are always together. They're not contradictory, but rather complementary. You see, you obey the one in whom you believe, and you believe in the one whom you obey. Throughout the scriptures, God criticized people for their idolatry, for worshiping false gods, And he would show, he would make the connection between their false god and their behavior. You see, they were worshiping or believing in the one whom they obeyed, and they were obeying the one in whom they believed. They showed where their true faith was by whom they obeyed. 
Notice the rest of verse 16 here. It says, For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? This is interesting. Paul cites Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. And you know what follows Isaiah 53, verse 1. It's the remarkable and memorable prediction of the death and the everlasting reign of Jesus Christ. But in Isaiah's day, the Lord showed him that Christ would be despised and rejected by men. And the observation of man's unbelief at the end of verse 16 is used here in Romans to prove the earlier assertion of man's disobedience in verse 16. Do you see that? They have not all obeyed the gospel. Here comes his proof. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Gospel and report are the same thing. Believed and obeyed are the same thing. What I mean is this. Paul proves that they did not obey the word of God. They did not obey the gospel. And what's his proof? They didn't believe it. So do you see how implicit in disobedience is unbelief? Likewise, implicit in belief is obedience. Obedience and faith always go together. You cannot have a sincere faith apart from obedience. So, you must obey the word of God. Now then, if you can recall, just a little while ago, back in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, Paul described the goal of his ministry, and he said it is this, obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That is to say, Christ's name. And how did the apostle intend to bring about that obedience to the faith? Well, a couple of verses after that, in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1, he says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. Why preaching? Do you see that? Paul's, Paul's means of bringing about this obedience to the faith is his preaching. The answer to this is because preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Let me say that one more time. The preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Paul says in verse 17, And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. His goal was to bring about obedience of faith, And the means by which he sought to bring that about was preaching. Now, when I said that preaching is the word of God, that may seem strange. How do I say that? Look with me at the connection here between verse 17 and verses 14 through 16. How then shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And then he comes to what's a conclusion or a summarizing statement. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Do you see it? In verse 14, he's talking about preaching. In verse 15, he's talking about preaching. In verse 16, he's talking about preaching. And then in verse 17, he concludes with the word of God. He's saying that the word of God is the means of salvation. And the word of God is communicated by preaching. Therefore, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. In fact, the hearing that is referenced in verse 17 refers not to the hearing of the words of the preachers, merely. It actually refers to hearing God. Let me try to explain this to you. In the Greek language, verbs of sense, meaning verbs like hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, they take an object in something called the genitive case. 
So when a verb of sense, such as our verb here, hearing, is followed by a genitive phrase, ordinarily what that means is the genitive phrase is its object. What's our construction here? We have a verb of sense, hearing, followed by the genitive phrase, the word of God. What I am saying is what this passage is telling you is not merely hearing the words about God, but rather hearing, hearing what? The word of God. In the preaching of the word of God, it is God himself whom you are supposed to be hearing. God is the one speaking in the word of God. Now, in this verse, some versions read the word of Christ, where I've said the the word of God. Some manuscripts do indeed have the word Christ rather than God. For our purposes, it really makes no difference. Christ is God. We've already seen above, back in verse 13, that calling on the name of the Lord means to call upon Jesus. And while I am inclined to agree with the New King James, which follows the King James Version, that it is here referencing the Word of God, we need not worry because God is Christ and Christ is God. And if some other versions say Christ, we are okay with that. So then, the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God, and it is Christ, or God, who in the preaching of the Word that is heard. In fact, if we go back for a moment to verse 14, it says this, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Here again, this is not saying merely how shall they believe in the one whom they've not heard about. This is saying, quite literally, how is it they're going to believe someone who they've not heard? They can't believe in God if they have not heard God. And that, beloved, is what you ought to be looking for in the reading and preaching of the word of God. To hear God. And you've probably heard this joke before, but it has been said, if you want to hear God, read your Bible. If you want to hear him audibly, read your Bible out loud. But actually, I want to say this, I agree with our confession, which says that God makes the reading of the word of God, but especially the preaching of the word of God, effectual to our salvation. There is something different between your own personal study of the Word of God and even the public reading of the Word of God and the public ministry of the preaching of the Word of God. God, in His wisdom, has decided to take foolish things and use them to propagate His gospel. Now, from verses 16 and 17, we see that you must obey the word of God and that the word of God comes to you by preaching. Before I move on, let me make sure you don't misunderstand what I am saying. There should be a primacy upon the preaching of the word of God. That's what we are doing right now. But that shouldn't make you think that I am disparaging your other uses of the word of God. We also sing it, we also pray it, we also read it at home, we also gather together in groups to read it, and I commend you all for that, and I don't want you to cease from that. Those are important, those are good for you, those are beneficial. I just want you to see that in this text, that the apostle is especially distinguishing between other forms of the word of God and the preaching of the word of God. Now then... We obey the word of God, which comes to us by preaching, and from this we want to draw two applications before we move to our second point. First is this. Insofar as it is the word of God, you must obey the preaching of the word of God. Paul commended the Thessalonians and thanked God for them, saying this. You received the word of God, which you heard from us. You welcomed it, not as the word of men, 
but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Do you see what he's saying? You received my preaching, not as the words of man, but as it really is, as the word of God. The Thessalonians receiving that word from Paul and obeying it then did the will of God. Now this does not mean that you must receive everything that every preacher says. This does not mean that you must receive even everything that I say. What it does mean is that when I or another preacher tells you things that are expressly set down in the word of God or derived by good and necessary inferences from the word of God, in other words, when we preach to you what really is the word of God, then you must receive it and obey it. Second, before we move on, because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God, you have to limit your faith in God to what is taught in the word of God. Just as preachers cannot bind your conscience with things that are contrary or outside of the word of God, so also you must not let your faith in God rest upon things not revealed in the word of God. You must not obey the word of man as if it were the word of God. This is something that is sometimes called implicit faith. Right? Where we take someone at their word implicitly. Now there's a sense in which this is okay. Like think of with your spouse. And ordinarily they don't have to show you receipts for what they're saying. They ordinarily don't have to prove everything to you. But there's a difference between believing something on the basis of God's authority and believing something on the basis of a man's authority. Do you understand this difference? We live in an age where there are two extremes that I see. One of them is is everything is believe the experts. Whatever they say, implicitly you have to believe it. The science is settled. How dare you? It's the current year. The other error that we see are those who don't believe anything that any expert says immediately, right? When we're trying to avoid both of those extremes and resting ultimately our faith in God on the things which are taught in the word of God. I have seen, particularly within the last few years, significant and egregious instances of implicit faith and people at the same time preaching things not in the word of God as if they were the word of God and combining them with imperatival force from things in the word of God. Therefore, binding men's consciences illegitimately contrary to God's word. And do you know, beloved, that when you believe things contrary to God's word, you too are culpable, right? Even if someone deceives you, you too are culpable for believing lies. I'm going to give you an illustration for this that I may later regret, but it's important. There was a time not long ago, people would tell you that if you love your neighbor, you must shut down your church. You must wear a mask. You must receive this medication or that medication. You must do these things in order to love your neighbor. Beloved, is that in the word of God? Or is that by good and necessary inference from the word of God? By no means. You see, that's an instance then of people binding men's consciences with something that's not the word of God, but calling it the word of God, right? Using the imperatival force of God's word, love your neighbor. And yet, it was not God's word. It was a lie. It was a mistake. It was an error. Incidentally, if you were one who said things like that to people, 
Here are nine words that I want you to consider. I am sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And if you were one of those who was bludgeoned with those kinds of things, and someone comes to you and asks for your forgiveness... I want you to think about seven words. I forgive you as Christ forgives me. So then our faith must be upon the word of God, and we must be careful about either binding men's consciences on things that are not in the word of God, and about implicitly putting our faith in something without scrutinizing it, without considering what the actual word of God says. We must believe the word of God, but we are not required to rest our faith upon the words of men. Let's look at our second point. We've seen that we have to obey the word of God, but let's look briefly at how it is possible that you can hear the word of God and know it and yet not be saved by it. Here, the example of Israel is a great warning to you. They heard the word. They knew the word. But they did not obey the word. Verse 18 says this, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. You might recognize here the allusion to Psalm 19, verse 4, which is in the first half of that psalm, it speaks of God's general revelation, God revealing himself in his creation. It may seem strange to us that Paul is using a passage about God's revelation in nature to prove that Israel has heard the word of God. There's a couple of things that we need to consider. First of all, that psalm, Psalm 19, in the first six six verses, speaks of God's revelation in nature, but then beginning in verse 7 speaks of God's revelation in his word in the scriptures. So anyone who catches the allusion to the psalm is familiar enough with the scriptures such that they cannot say they have not heard the word of God. Secondly, I want us to think back to just a little while ago again in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, in which Paul said this, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, the Gentiles, are without excuse. If creation is sufficient to render the Gentiles inexcusable, what shall we say about the Jews who had Psalm 19, who had Moses, who had all the prophets, who had John the baptizer, who had the Lord Jesus Christ, and who had the apostles? Do you see, if God's revelation in nature, which is, comparatively speaking, vague, and little compared to the word of God, if that's enough to condemn the Gentiles for their sins, how much more the Jews who had been entrusted with the oracles of God. So there's also sort of a comparison here. In the same way that the sun and moon and stars go out to the whole earth, there's, there's no place where their voice is not heard. It's similar now to the ministry of the gospel beginning with the apostles, right? They started going into the whole world. They began in Jerusalem and into Judea and to the ends of the earth. And even if you just study the life of the apostle Paul, you saw how he went all over the inhabited world of the Roman world at the time. Beginning with them, then, the gospel has gone forth on all the earth. There are people today, I mean, I think about how far away we are from where the gospel first started. And yet, if these people have heard and believed the gospel, Israel cannot say they did not hear it because the gospel began with them. They had what Matthew Henry called the right of first refusal. It was up to them to accept or reject the gospel. Do you know the gospel 
did not go to the Gentiles at large until Christ's own rejected it. It was on the heels of their rejection that the gospel went to the Gentiles. So they cannot say they did not hear it. Moreover, the Jews could claim that they did not know, right? They, okay, well, we heard it, but we didn't know. We didn't understand it. We, we didn't know the stakes. We didn't know that this was going to be it. But verse 19, Paul says, But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. Verse 19. This is a quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. I want you to hear the rest of the verse. The beginning of the verse says this. This is the Lord speaking. He says, They, Israel, have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. Do you see that all the way back to the time of Moses, the Lord was warning Israel that their disobedience was going to have disastrous consequences. Because they were worshiping other gods, God was going to replace them with another people, with a people who would obey him. They knew. And more than that, consider how their current and and their jealousy in the Apostle Paul's day, remember how the Jews would follow him around, going to places where he preached, trying to undermine him. Remember how they sought to kill him. Remember how they beat him and stoned him. Remember all of this as an example of their jealousy. That jealousy confirms their guilty knowledge. You see, they are jealous against the Gentiles just as the Lord said they would be. They can't say they didn't know because they are jealous about it. Do you know that to this day, there are still some Jews that Jesus was the bastard son of a Roman centurion. They say he was born of sexual immorality. He didn't know who his father was. They say that he was a magician who performed his miracles by the power of Satan. Do you know that they still to this day surmise that the disciples stole his body from the tomb? All of this is blasphemous nonsense, by the way. But consider this. In order for them to devise alternate explanations for these things, in order to devise an alternate explanation for the virgin birth, or for Christ's miracles, or for his resurrection, what must they first know? They must first know the claims of his birth. They must first know the claims of his miracles. They must first know the claims of his resurrection. In order to tell lies about these things, in order to be jealous about them, they must first know them. Do you see how in their jealousy they are confirming their knowledge of the word of God? It came to them. Now, in verses 20 and 21, we find a quotation from Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 1 and 2. And this supplies a remarkable contrast between the Gentiles who believed and then the Jews who did not believe. Concerning the Gentiles, it says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. We were described, beloved, as foolish nobodies, right? Those who are not a nation and a foolish nation. We were nothing and foolish. Yet, we found God. I want you to just observe here for a moment the sovereign mercy of God. Those who did not seek him found him. Those who did not ask from him had him manifested to them. Nevertheless, how is it that they came to be saved by them? He sent preachers. Those preachers preached. They heard. 
They believed and they called upon the name of the Lord. You see, they obeyed the gospel, which provoked the Jews to jealousy. The jealousy which is being discussed right here. But look at verse 21. Concerning the Jews, it says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The Lord patiently, with great long-suffering, with great compassion, for centuries, beloved, think about it, from the time of Abraham to the time of Christ, 20 centuries. And even in the day of Moses, the Lord was warning Israel, Because of their disobedience, this was going to happen. And yet the Lord continually held forth his hands to them. Matthew Henry remarked that as Christ was crucified, even then his hands were stretched out to his people Israel. How how was Christ received? by disobedience and a contrary stiff-neckedness. Beloved, God is patient. But there is a limit to his patience. Proverbs 29, verse 1 says this, He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Do you see, when, when God finally decides to destroy you for your disobedience, that's a fall from which you may not recover. Consider the nation of Israel today. The the straits in which they are in. You cannot look at the last 20 centuries and ignore the connection between their denial of the Lord's Christ and then the hard road which they have had since then. They were suddenly destroyed, and, as, and since there has not been a remedy. I know there's excitement over 1947 and the Jews returned to their homeland. Beloved, do you know what's in Jerusalem right now on the site where their temple used to be? The Dome of the Rock. A monument to idolatry. They have not returned to the Lord, and the Lord has not returned to them. There has not been a remedy. The remedy is to turn back to Jesus Christ. That is their only hope. So consider the obstinacy and the perverseness of Israel, God's chosen people. But are we not today the Israel of God? I can't help but think looking around the church, the the visible church around the world today, and, and say we've been given more, much more even, than the nation of Israel. And we have great wickedness in the church. God has been very tolerant with us. God has been very patient. And I can't help but consider the lesson of Israel. Will God tolerate it forever? Or will he also tear us down. There are many in history who have received judgment much more quickly than the Christian church, particularly the Christian church in the West. The gospel was preached to Israel by Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets and John the baptizer and the Son of God and his apostles. And We have the gospel likewise preached not only by all of them, but also by evangelists and ministers. And we have all of this. Now then, what is the difference then between those who hear the word and are saved and those who hear the word and that are not saved? The ones who hear the word and are saved are the ones who obey it. The ones who hear the word and are not saved are the ones who disobey it. You might want me at this point to explain to you the sovereign grace of God 
and in how it was by the, the, the regeneration of God, the Holy Spirit, who first enables us to believe. And that is very true. It is based upon God's sovereign election and his effectual call. These are all very true. But do you know that's not the point the apostle is making here? The point he is making is that you must obey the word of God. God has been merciful. He reaches out his hands to disobedient people. He gives them his word, and then he holds them accountable for how they respond to it. Those who obey the word are those who can be confident that they are saved. I want to finish with some helps for obeying, just brief things. As I exhort you to obey the word of God... Number one, remember who it is that is speaking to you. Who is it that commands you? It is God, your maker. More than that, your redeemer. He is your Lord, but he is also your savior. God has the right to command you, and he also died for you. Beloved, nothing your God commands you is anything except for very good for you. Therefore, remember that when the Lord commands you, it is for your good. Another help. When it is God who is speaking to you, understand that it is requisite for you to have help from God to hear him. God speaks to you his words, but it is God the Holy Spirit who makes those words discernible to you. So when you are about to read the word of God or hear the word of God or study the word of whatever it is, request God's help. Ask him to help you. Ask him to send the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, recognize the battle that's taking place. Recognize the difficulty that there is genuinely a battle. You, you have in you an inclination to disobey the word of God. Let's just be honest about this. We have in us remnants of sin, fleshly desires that make us prone to disobey the word of God. Start with that assumption and that you're going to have to actually work at it, actually focus on it, actually strive to obey the word of God. Fourthly, resist the devil's attempts to distract you you from the word of God, to take away the word of God, to get you to disobey the word of God. Know that that is the devil's goal, right? The apostle Paul has a goal. He was preaching the gospel in order to bring about obedience of faith. The devil has a goal, undermining the gospel in order to bring about disobedience. Isn't that how he deceived our first mother? By persuading her to disobey the word of God. He does the same thing to us, so resist those attempts. When you see it, you will see it when you are finding rationalizations and good reasons to obey what you know God says. Did he not hear? Did she not know? She heard. She knew. She told herself she had good reasons to disobey what she knew God said. When you start doing that, when I start doing that, that's when we are being used by the devil. Number five, rejoice in the blessings of obedience. It helps you to obey the word of God when you recognize that obedience comes with rewards, that God promises blessings, right? If, if you believe the gospel and if you call upon Christ as Lord, you will be saved. It's okay to look forward to that. It's okay to rejoice in that. It's okay to say, Lord, I'm going to do what you said and look forward to the reward which you promised. Don't focus on what you can't have if you obey. Focus on what you do have and what you will have when you obey. Sixthly, repent when you fail. When you fail, repent. Recognize it when you see that you have re- have failed against the Lord, don't be stiff-necked like Israel, right? All day long, God is holding out his hands. All day long, right? But you have to repent. And all that means is, God, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. 
Seventh and lastly on this, receive the word of God with meekness. Receive the word of God with meekness. You know, when we talk about the word of God coming to us, there is some difficulty. Sometimes we have to discern. Sometimes we have to work at it. But this is much easier if we humble ourselves. I want you to think about those Bereans, those noble Bereans in the book of Acts, whom the Apostle Paul commends. It says they received the word with gladness, and they searched the scriptures to see whether it was true. Do you see how they're doing two things? They're receiving the word preached with gladness, but they're also doing their very best to search the scriptures to see what is being preached to them is true. You see, sometimes it takes some effort on our part. You need to think on these things. You need to weigh them against the word of God. You need to be talking with each other about it. But that's easier to do when we receive the word with meekness. As James, the Lord's brother, says, was receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let's pray. Almighty God, we confess again that your word is truth, and by it we are saved. Help us according to the promises of your word and according to the power of God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.